What we're doing, we started in 2010, is when we have someone arrested for a crime, or someone we suspect of a crime, um, we will ask them consensually for their DNA. Uh, we have about a 94% compliance rate where people give up their DNA. Why they do it, I don't know, but it's the same way, why does someone give his consent to search the trunk of a car when they know they have seven kilos of cocaine in the back? I don't know, but I've been doing, I've been in law enforcement for 30 years, and we've been doing it for 30 years, and unless the United States Supreme Court tells me to stop, I'm going to continue to do it. But given the vast potential for abuse of DNA and the profound privacy implications that are at stake, the close regulation and constitutional scrutiny of the government amassing the DNA of its citizenry is essential. And we're talking about DNA of innocent people here. Fred Heron, Stephen Mercer is raising one of the key points here, which is the FBI database, which I mentioned at the top of our conversation, is of course governed by federal regulations. There are lots of rules about how that database is operated, chain of custody, and everything else. In your jurisdiction and many other states around the country, those regulations don't apply and the rules are different everywhere you go. Well, a, a couple of things here. He, he, first, he's a defense attorney, so of course he's going to take that stand, and I'm going to take my stand, and that's what makes this country great. And leave it to someone from Maryland to bring up a race issue. That is not the issue here. I don't know where we jump from DNA to race, but we, we do not have a disproportionate, I, and I don't have those numbers, but I can certainly get back to you. It is not primarily African-American or Hispanic uh, database. That, that's just a ludicrous statement. But going back to, the, to what you were saying about the FBI, they have CODIS. Uh, which is the federal database what governs the three different databases, a local, a state, and then there's a national database. In Pennsylvania, if I was to submit DNA from a crime, from a property crime uh, incident, I mean burglary, theft, it takes over 18 months to get those results. That's not acceptable. Right now, I'm doing it in less than 30 days. It takes sexual assault rape seven months in Pennsylvania to process. I can get it back. I have a job right now, I'm getting the results back tomorrow. We submitted it three day, two days ago, I'm getting the results back tomorrow. Plus, Ben Salem Township, what you said is officers are out there on their own. We have rules and regulations regarding the collection of DNA. We are state certified, we are state accredited, and we are finishing our national CLIA accreditation, which we should get accredited in November. So it's not a road cop out there just like with swab of a, of a Q-tip collecting DNA. So Stephen Mercer, then before we go, can you just comment on my impression that I had when I started reading about this, that if the cops asked me, for my DNA and I didn't have to give it, I, I would be nuts to say yes. Well, yes, absolutely, because what you're not hearing about is the very real risk of misidentification that can occur uh, in these local data banks, which are really, truly the repositories of junk DNA. These local data banks, which are unregulated, invite the junk from crime scenes that isn't allowed in a quality controlled database at the state or national level. And so when you start creating these local data banks of innocent person's DNA, and remember, Mr. Heron keeps talking about criminals. He's not talking, in this local database, uh, are not compelled samples from those convicted, but these are people that Mr. Heron suspects will commit a crime, and so he wants their DNA for some future investigation. All right, I, I, I and, have and, to, Fred, I have to. and Fred, we, we, we gotta go so quickly, your response. Uh, I said in the beginning, these are all ASCLAD certified. They have the same compliance with the FBI quality assurance standards and forensic testing of DNA. They're not, they're not rogue labs. Junk DNA is an old term. All that is is we're not looking to see if you have genetic disabilities and medical conditions. We're looking to identify you as an individual that could, that have possibly committed that crime. It's not some lab that just opened up around the corner next to a bodega. This is, that's a ridiculous assertion. He, he knows better than that. And this, these yeah, labs, you're, you're all certified in Fred, Fred well, I know, I know voting labs. They are certified. Guys, 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 labs. guys. This is not a question of a rogue lab. This is a question of a rogue data bank. You can put in your data bank what you can't put it's in a rational right. data bank. It absolutely is. We have, you cannot clear. submit. Right. You can put right. into your forensic right. unknown index at the local right. level sample you're, you're, that you cannot put in the national level, and you know that, and don't deny it. You're, you're, you're comparing apples to oranges now. And no, the other thing that we didn't I'm talk not, about is right we don't use the DNA as the get-all. We also, after we bring these people in, they confess to the crime. It's just a pointer for us. It's not the end all where we right. go put in handcuffs after we get the DNA results back. Let's, but this is not a 10-minute conversation. That's the problem. Okay. Well, you're right about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you can hear some of the controversy that's embedded in the collection of DNA, Fred Heron, Director of Public Safety of the Van Salem Police Department in Pennsylvania. Fred, thanks so much.
Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Stephen Mercer, Chief Attorney for the Forensics Division of the Maryland Office of the Public Defender. Stephen, thanks. Thank you.